of the 40 most influential New Hampshireites who have vastly enriched human understanding. She served on the advisory committee for New Hampshire Listens, and she's been featured in foundation publications and events. That's the Charitable Foundation, New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Jerry Ann, thank you for being with us this evening. We're honored to be partnering with you and the New Hampshire Black Heritage Trail on this event. And we look forward to more partnerships going forward. I'll go ahead and turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Rick. And thank you all for coming to listen to this presentation. I'm gonna to try to keep it as informal as I can, um, even though I'm doing a presentation because there's a lot of ongoing research um, around um, what we're talking about tonight, the connection between um, Portsmouth um, merchants and the slave trade and the whole um, slave, slavery industrial complex, I'll, I'll call it, as it extends way beyond just um, just the trade, the human trade in human cargo. So um, just bear in mind that we're still researching and um, I'll share as much as we can. And, and I know there are a bunch of historians on, so correct me, <laughs> especially the shipbuilders here. So I'll share the screen. and start our presentation. Does everybody see that? I'm never too sure. Okay. So um, as already introduced as the, the executive director for the Black Heritage Trail and at the Black Heritage Trail, we're working to uh, share the stories of New Hampshire's Black history in order to build more inclusive communities. And we do this um, through our headquarters at 222 Court Street, a building we purchased around almost three years ago now, um, serves as the home for our programs, a meeting place for our tours. Um, we have a small exhibit um, area and we're beginning to do research in our office. And um, for many of you who are in Portsmouth or around here, you may know our programs, our Winter Tea Talks, the, um, this Guided Tours, Juneteenth Celebration, and our Black New England Conference. We are just steps away from the African Burying Ground Memorial. And for those who are in Portsmouth, you may recognize this image here, or if any of you um, are from out of town and haven't seen it. This is the memorial that um, uh, recognizes and honor the um, enslaved, the um, formerly enslaved uh, and African and African Americans that um, early recorded in, in Portsmouth. This is what the burying ground looked like in 2003, pretty much unlike any um, typical colonial New England burying ground. It was paved over, built upon, and um, the history of the folks who were buried there was, um, was erased and their story disappeared from our public, um, public memory. Um, but however, this space now with its, with its um, as it was reconstructed and returned to sacred ground gives us an opportunity to talk about not only Portsmouth involvement in the slave trade, um, the transatlantic slave trade, but also um, New Hampshire's and you know the, the whole of um, Northern New England, because the mythology is often that there was not slavery in the North, that slavery was just a Southern institution. Back in 2003, um, during regular construction, uh, a backhoe um, was doing some work on the road on Court Street and they hit um, some coffins. And the Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail back in 2000 had put a marker on one of the buildings designated the area as the African burying ground. Valerie Cunningham, who some of you may know, 
the um, founder of the Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail and founding mother for the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire. I've done all this research and found an, an, a 1700 map that designated this area in Court Street as the um, Negro burying ground is what it was called back then. Um, this image that you're looking at is just a, a, a superimposed image of the, the um, coffins that um, some were on earth or some that they knew were there, the sighting um, on 222 Court Street. We also know that um, for those who don't know the story, um, in 2003, when the backhoe um, unearthed these these, cof the, these coffins, the mayor, um, they immediately stopped the work on the road. The mayor formed a Blue Ribbon com um, Commission um, to try to figure out how best to honor this, honor the sacred space that had been disturbed. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, the archaeologists uh, doing their work on 222 Court Street. And at the bottom of the picture, um, we can tell that this was not the first time that these, um, these coffins were disturbed because you can see an 18th century pipe going through a line of coffins. Um, on under the street. And there were also back in the 1800s, uh, various um, reports in the newspapers that spoke of, as you can imagine, as these houses were being built upon on these um, grave sites, that they were unearthing um, bones and um, skeletal remains of humans. Those remains were um, DNA tested and, and it was, uh, they all had, all the remains that were tested um, had markers um, for West African markers in the DNA. So that proved that this was indeed a African burying ground. And it really took that, not only the unearthing of these um, remains, but that D the proof, that solid DNA proof for not only Portsmouth, but New Hampshire to come to grips that yes, indeed, um, Portsmouth like Newport, Rhode Island flourished as a shipbuilding city. And like Newport, the town grew wealthy from the trade of kidnap Africans and its ancillary goods. From the density of the burials and the site of the area being covered, the state archaeologists estimated that there were approximately 200 souls buried here. And um, we're not sure just how far the burying ground went, but um, because one end of it in the map was left open, but that was um, the best estimate that the uh, archaeologists could give. So Portsmouth, just um, like a lot of Northern towns, uh, were involved in the triangular trade from its early settlement, which in the case of the US trade included New England, Africa, um, spots on the African continent, um, North America and the Caribbean. New England traders would send ships loaded with rum and other goods to the coast of Africa to trade for enslaved Africans. The ship would then take the human cargo across what we come to know, call today as the Middle Passage to ports in Caribbean islands or Southern US states. They, there they would sell the enslaved Africans and often buy cargoes of sugar cane, molasses and other goods produced with slave labor to bring North to markets in New England. Distilleries in the north would then make rum from the sugar cane, which in turn would be sold in Africa again for um, more um, slaves. From the 16th to the 18th century, an estimated about 12 million African crossed the Atlantic to the Americas in this um, transatlantic slave trade. And as we um, were able to not only from the history book, but also the solid proof from the burying ground, Portsmouth was a big part in that triangular trade 
which made significant profits for our shipbuilders and um, traders here. And, you know, the Portsmouth, our other seaport towns grew wealthy from this, um, from this trade. There's a long history of ship and boat building on the New England coast. Large ocean going ships have been built in Portsmouth area since the 1600s when the wood from New England forest were brought down by the river. Uh, the, it, it was, we became really um, successful in building ships because we had the tall pine trees. The Northern New Hampshire pine trees were um, once also reserved exclusively for the mass of the King of England ships. So we did a healthy tray, um, uh, trade in building ships. Between 1728 and 1745, Portsmouth captains mastered ships owned by wealthy Portsmouth families bound for Guinea, Virginia, and Barbados. Their ca cargo typically included from one to 12 enslaved people along with other merchandise. Some of the names that we found connected to um, uh, trading in uh, enslaved Africans were Samuel Morris Dickerson, John Major, Joseph Bailey, and John Orderon who were captains of ships owned by Pierce Long, Joshua Pierce, John Ringe, J.S. Wentworth, and other um, well-known slavers was um, the senior Langdon, Governor Langdon's dad and the Moffat lads. And I'm really excited to have a Moffat lad descendant who will talk a little bit, um, just to share a little bit of information as we go along. Um, you, like I said earlier that the, usually our ships that were here in Portsmouth that were trading in, that would dock in um, in our in the wharf here in Portsmouth would normally carry one to 12 um, enslaved people. An exception was um, given to us by recorded history occurred in 1755 when a vessel owned by John Moffat, the Exeter carried a large number and we have that um, documentation, documentation that said 20 men slaves um, were on board that ship, seven more boys slaves. Is, that's the language that was in this documentation. Tevin, 10 boy slaves, 15 women slaves, two women girls, seven girls slaves for a total of 61 um, slaves. That import record, however, is one that survived, but it really doesn't tell us the whole story of um, the ships that may have come into our port because there was not a lot of record keeping um, on the quantity of enslaved people that came through Portsmouth. One of the things in New Hampshire is that we didn't have, we didn't tax, um, we didn't have a tariff on in importing enslaved people. So it would be a port that um, enslavers would bring, would dock, um, unload their cargo and ship them out uh, somewhere else instead of staying here in Portsmouth because we had that um, no tariff on the enslaved. So that was um, almost an underground um, trading of enslaved Africans. Um, this here is um, another a pretty famous ship that was built here, a clipper. It was built here in Portsmouth. Of the 200 clippers built in the United States, 28 of them came from the, our region, the Piscataqua region. And some attained fame far reaching their dimension. And that was the Nightingale. The Nightingale was built um, at the Hanscom shipyard in Elliott, Maine, and then it received all of its final fitting here in Portsmouth. Um, the, it, the Nightingale was built as a really fast ship so it could um, get in and out of ports real quickly 
and it was one of the most luxurious um, schooner built at that time. I can't remember if I have, yeah. In the fall of 1860, the Nancy, um, she arrived in England from New York and she really um, soon developed a reputation as being a slave ship. She sailed, uh, she did a lot of sales from Cambinda, Angola to Cuba and over time had about 2,000 Africans um, in irons in, in her hull that were taken um, through to Cuba and other places in the Caribbean. Um, in April of 1861, she was seized by the U.S. government and she was pulled because at that time slavery was illegal, the trading, the ship trade, but here we have a ship from Portsmouth um, I was going to say, um, doing something illegal. So um, in uh, the, she, she was seized. And at the time that she was seized, there were about 961 men, women, and children chained in the deck. Um, at the point she was captured um, when she was also loading on more slaves um, in Liberia. The slave trade in particular was dominated by Northern maritime industry. Um, what I have here is a, um, a list of some of the ships that were built here in, in our region in New Hampshire's port. And there is this website, slavevoyage.org, um, that you can search on and see. Um, and I try to, if this works, you can do a quick look at one of the database that's there. So it shows you the vessel name. Um, the port where it began its per began its journey, where it ended up, um, the captain, how many how many enslaved people were on the ship when it left, and how many were um, were um, still on the ship when it remained. And I'm just gonna pull up is this. No, Jerry Ann, I don't know that people are seeing the database that you're selecting there. You may no. have to. Yeah, you may have to. Um, well, oh, that's, you know what? I'm. Not, I, I we can do that at another time. Okay. Because it didn't come up. I thought it was would show. But the the same list here. Um, what I found really interesting in 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 this list um, was the the a lot of the ships that were built here in Portsmouth. Um, never never were was sent to England they all left out of England you know with their cargo and did the trade there but not here you know so there were a few of them who were doing doing business here in Portsmouth the ships that were built here so it was a really huge industry of us making these slave ships that was um, carrying cargo of um, enslaved Africans uh, throughout this transatlantic trade, but coming from different places, from London, from Bristol, you know, and so that they were not then recorded as being um, U.S. ships, nor Portsmouth ships. They were then part of the British trade or the Spanish trade, but not, not the U.S. trade. I thought that was really interesting when we were looking at that. And there's so much more work to do. But this is a fantastic database. I can put the, the link in the chat for people who wanna um, look through and see what was going on in New England around shipbuilding. I can never get this to work. All right. Portsmouth merchants knew that money could be made in the sale of enslaved Africans elsewhere than in Portsmouth. And as, as you can see from that, uh, sh the ships going, coming out from other, other 
um, countries and other towns. This was, we know this because there was a local newspaper article in 1758, which mentioned that the richest taken, and I'm quoting, the richest taken from Senegal in gum, gold, slaves, and other effects is supposed to be worth near 70,000 pounds. A subsequent article expressed in a local paper, um, hoping to gain control of the Gori Island. So it said the island of Gori, a little eastward of Gambia, which we have strong hopes of by the advices sent home by Commander Marsh, by, the Nas by Nassau, by the most valuable port of the coast of Guinea, would be open to us. So they know, no doubt, that the, the merchants here in Portsmouth knew of the slave trade, knew of the value, the money that they could make um, in, um, in participating in this um, sale of human cargo and its ancillary goods. And here we have the, um, one of the famous ports, um, this, the gate that we hear a lot of in the Gori Island, the gateway of no return. The last site place that some of the enslaved Africans would have seen before they were shipped out, stolen from their homeland. Two. Now, enslavement of Africans, as I said earlier, was part of Portsmouth life by 1645. Portsmouth merchants were involved in the slave trade by 1680. And in 1682, we know that it was not just doing trade here in Portsmouth, but all over the country as well. There was a letter that um, a Mr. William Fitzberg from Virginia wrote to Mr. Cutts of Portsmouth regarding the prices that he would pay for enslaved boys, girls, men, and women. He had like 3,000 to 5,000 pounds of tobacco is what he would pay for each um, person that um, Cuts could procure and um, bring to him in Virginia. So this is just the dock at Prescott Park where we know um, the enslaved people would be would um, would disembark from the ships, be sold, um, some at the docks and some in some of our taverns around town. Studley's Tavern being one of them. Um, the slave trade helped to build the growing economies of northern seaports like Portsmouth and support the economies of many towns along New England coast and further inland. Slave traders paid the shipbuilders, they um, paid insurance, they paid the black blacksmiths and a wide variety of other tradesmen, the ropes, the mass baker, the sail makers, the, the whole merchandising of um, and, and monetary exchange involved in, this, in the slave trade was wide and deep in, in Portsmouth and New Hampshire as well. Almost every business and industry in the region traded or did business with merchants or shippers whose wealth was generated by, by enslaving Africans. In addition, those who invested in um, salvaged voyage came from almost all walks of life. Um, we have the rich families who were um, building the ships uh, setting up insurance companies, as well as really small tradesmen and artisans, such as blacksmiths, mason, bakers, rope makers, painters, who were also providing labor and getting paid from this trade. Um, from this trade, um, a lot of our traders, um, we know, also diversified their their holdings, and um, this is an example of this is. Um, Alexander Hamilton Ladd from the Moffat Ladd House in Portsmouth. You know, he um, became an agent um, for several of the largest cotton mills in New England, and he would purchase his cotton from Galveston, Texas. He lived most of the um, cooler months in Texas, and I'm, in 1859, when the war broke up, um, his trade went down, but then 
He resumed the work after the Civil War. His nephew also participated in, in the trade of purchasing and trade of cotton from plantations in the South, in Texas, used um, using slave labor. And um, one of the things that um, I thought was really interesting for 40 years after it was established, um, the Moffett Ladd House in Texas remained one of the largest buying houses of cotton in Texas. Um, the, the whole purchase of um, cotton was not the only um, sideline of, of the industry, but it definitely was, um, was a big one of them. Some of our northern um, shipbuilders also owned plantations either in the Caribbean or in the south where they would employ in, um, enslaved people. They could create their own cotton, <laughs> uh, sugar mills have their own distillery, um, sell that in, the, in Africa, buy slaves and continue that whole triangular trade and keeping all that wealth from each part of, the, um, of, of their income within their families. So we see these um, real old New England families becoming really wealthy from the slave trade. Another story that I'm just adding here because it gives us another view of what's going on, um, not only in the, in, not only with our ships here in, in New Hampshire, but also with the, um, with the African and, and the enslaved population here in our country. And that is the story of Ona Marie Judd, who um, many of you may know um, was enslaved to George and Martha Washington. Um, Ona, uh, when she learned that she was to be given away as a wedding present to Martha's niece, decides that decided she would um, escape enslavement, and she did this by um, by um, escaping uh, through with the help of the black community in Pennsylvania, which was the um, city, which was the uh, house of the president at that time. Uh, she walks out one day when they were packing. What George and Martha Washington used to do is every six months, they would, uh, they would turn over um, their enslaved staff because in Pennsylvania, um, it was a gradual abolitionist state and they didn't want their enslaved people to be able to file for, if, if an enslaved person lived in Pennsylvania for more than six months, they could petition for their freedom. And the uh, Washingtons, in order not to have that every six months, would change their staff out so that they couldn't put, um, file for um, a petition to, to be freed. So Ona escapes there with the help of the Black abolitionist, and she um, escapes on a schooner owned by John Bowles, um, who was a captain here in um, Portsmouth. Um, Bowles owned a, he had a profitable freight business in going from Maine to Pennsylvania to New York, where he traded in leather goods. And um, he, we, I presume he was part of the Underground Railroad. Did he know that he carried um, the president's enslaved person when she tried to escape? We're not sure, but most likely he did. He brings her to Portsmouth and um, she's able to live uh, in Portsmouth. She never got her freedom, but um, through the Underground Railroad, she's able to live free in Portsmouth. That's just an overview of, um, I'm sure people will have a lot of questions, but it's just an overview of some of um, Portsmouth uh, connection to the slave trade here. And um, I just, our goal here at the Black Heritage Trail is to share these stories, these untold stories, uh, a true or more um, honest history of not only African-American history, but American history. And we do this to create stronger bonds of understanding 
in, engage hearts and minds in, in, in really looking at our history and creating bridges um, that would normally divide us. We're crossing that bridge. Um, our next program coming up just as just as a advertisement for what we're doing is our Juneteenth celebration, um, Found Lineage, celebrating African-American roots and branches. We'll have a workshop, a live concert at the music hall, panel discussions, and um, drumming and dancing for as an ancestor reverence. We're just looking at the whole um, importance of this work by um, DNA, um, what, what the study of DNA is telling us and the new stories that are coming up. And we look forward to doing that. And I may have, um, Tanya, um, just say a few words real quickly, if that's okay. okay. Hi, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Jerry Ann, for the invitation. I'm a descendant of Moffats and Lads and Langdons and Odeorns. And um, the more research I do on Portsmouth and Kittery, the more <laughs> names I find in my family tree. Um, and I, I wanna just express the gratitude for everyone being here and, and name something that's part of this history, which is the history of silencing our interconnected histories. I did not know until 2016 that New England had anything to do with slavery. And the way that I busted through my ignorance was by finding letters on my dad's shelf that were there from when my grandfather died that were written, actually written by John, John Moffat, who was responsible for the Exeter ship that Jerry Ann mentioned. Um, and all of these letters that I read, there's over hundred pages of letters between my ancestors we're passed on schooners. They name they name the ship they're going on. So talk about sailing. They're all the letters only exist. Ancestors were separated and using ships. Um, but it is through one clue I started asking questions and doing research and unturning stones uh, that brought me to Jerry Ann. And I I know there's so much division in the nation and so much attempted division and so many people talking about what's divisive. And I wanna say as a descendant of enslavers that for me, learning the history is healing. It's not easy, but it's healing because now I'm actually connected to my ancestors. I'm holding a, a, a horse chestnut seed from a tree that was planted in 1776 where my ancestors lived next to that tree for generations. Um, and so teaching the history is important. I want to just add one piece to what, what Jerry Ann said, uh, thinking about shipbuilding. And I looked at this beautiful book. I don't know if you've read this book, Lives of Consequence from Patricia Wall, you know, cheers to local historians. But she said that Robert Cutts, who was the grandparents of the first people to live in the Moffat Lad House, right? So the grandfather-in-law of John Moffat. Um, his shipyard was established in 1648, right, in Kittery. Um, and in his inventory in 1674, there were listed eight enslaved people. So three men, two women, two ch children who were female and, and one who was male. We don't know their names from this record, um, but most likely they were shipbuilders. So when we think about the shipbuilders of the region, you might know the names of my ancestors who were shipbuilders and you know the names, thank you to Valerie Cunningham, right? Valerie Cunningham and, and Mark Sammons and, and more local historians, you know the names of some free and enslaved black people who worked on shipbuilding. Um, but also I wanna just honor the people who were building ships who because of our racist, racist record keeping and, and dehumanization, we don't have their names, um, but they built some of those, those ships that we see. I am going to be talking and, as a guest speaker as part of the Juneteenth. So if you're interested in hearing more just about the legacy, for me, what started was understanding one clue, one enslaver and asking more questions. 
And what I learned was that there's seven consecutive generations that were building ships or involved in the trade. And I say this not just for the, the hard part, but I only knew my grandparents. My grandfather loves to sail. My uncle loves to sail. My, I mean, how many people here love to sail? Is that part of what this group's about? We like sailing, right? And, and sailing has always been about nature and, and relaxation and connecting to water. And understanding this history is a hard, it brings a hard lens to what sailing has meant in my family. Um, but it also just brings a richer grounding, right? To who we are and what we're standing on so we can actually collaborate and heal. So I'm not sure my time, I'll just keep it short, right, Jerry Ann? You know, I can ramble. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so Rick, I'm not sure how you do Q&A, but we're happy to answer any questions. Sure, we've got a couple in the um, chat section. It looks like that you answered one or two of them, but um, I don't know if everyone saw those. So uh, one of the questions, and this is one that um, has been discussed a lot in our office and amongst our uh, crew and staff, and that is, are there any records of Gundalo's uh, involvement in the slave trade? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, do you, do you know, Rick? Because uh, I no. haven't, I haven't seen that yet. Um, schooners and, um, but I haven't seen the, the Gundalo's yet. I have not. Um, there are uh, some people on this call that are probably a lot smarter than I am that may have done a lot more research than I have uh, in that respect. So um, I would be happy to, uh, you know, let uh, someone, if they have some information to uh, share that with us. Uh, if not, they can just put it in the sh into the chat section there. Um, but it, it is one of those questions that because of the gundalos being used to carry um, goods and, and cargo back and forth between the uh, towns along Great Bay, Little Bay and the Piscataqua River down to Portsmouth, um, that there was speculation that uh, they could have carried enslaved people um, to those places as well. So we're, I think, looking into that as much as we can and um, trying to do some research to see if we can get the answer to that. Um, there's one other question. Uh, it says, are there any records of gun? I'm sorry, that was the same question, my mistake. Are there any first person accounts of enslaved Africans experiences in the Portsmouth slave trade? So we know we have some of them, Prince Whipple, who um, people may have heard of. We've got a first person um, stories from him the 20 enslaved men who signed the 1779 petition for, for slavery. We have some of their stories and um, some people who, um, uh, who um, would attain their freedom. We have some of their stories as well. After enslavement, we have some of their stories. Um, one, one of the things that is um, difficult and interesting about doing African-American research is we rely a lot on um, documentation from the, um, the enslavers to tell us the stories of the enslaved people. And that, that's not always reliable information because of the, percep the perspective that we're getting from, from that point of view. Um, when and, and then because this history was so erased and so destroyed, um, when the things that are remain, they, they come up, <laughs> it takes a lot of research to get to what we're looking for and to get these first person um, narratives, especially here in the North. Um, where the oral traditions are stronger in the South being carried from one generation to the next, we have those oral histories. Here, we're trying to piece together people's stories um, from all these different sources, you know, from church records, from um, diaries, from all the sources that we can find to really pull these together. So it's a little bit, um, 
if, if you even look at the African burying ground, there are no names of the people who were buried there because that he history was erased. We only have one documentation in one of the newspapers that said Primus Fowl was buried in the Negro burying ground. And we know about Primus Fowl because he was the typesetter for the, lo for the new newspaper, you know? And so we know his stories from that. Um, but all the other 200 souls who were buried there, their history was completely erased. That's a very unfortunate. Um, so we did have a uh, clarification on something from um, Susan, uh, who said that she had asked Valerie Cunningham a few years ago whether she had found any specific references to gundalos in the slave trade, and said, and she said she had not. Um, so that's one poor, one more piece of information there. Um, um, it doesn't mean it's not there because right. every time we turn around, we're finding stuff. Yep. And um, again, Valerie's done incredible work in bringing forth um, these these stories. But as Tanya said, um, you you um, uncover one. It's like peeling the onion. You uncover one story. You think you're looking at this story, and then a whole new story comes up. We we currently have a database that the Black Heritage Trail have put together of over two thousand names. Um, of African, African Americans in our area in this database. So the more we do it, the more research we do, the more um, people are calling us all the time. Well, did you know that this was here? You know, we have this um, formerly enslaved Revolutionary War vet in Warner that you don't have in your list. So we're getting these calls. And so it doesn't mean that we can't there isn't a connection, just that we don't have it now. Sure. No, um, Tanya? Another oh. connection that, that just came up there always, you find them as you keep digging, but does anybody know the history of the, the first water aqueduct in Portsmouth and who funded that? So it was Elephant Lad, who, who was one of my ancestors too. He's one of the grandparents of one of the generations that lived in the Moffat Lad house, the lads there. Um, he was a shipbuilder in Exeter and he made a lot of money in trade. And uh, one of his civic projects was the first waterway in Portsmouth. So another thing just to think about is the landscape and the wealth and things we think of as well, it's just water, you know, but it really was the wealth of the community. I'm sorry, another question that came in. Um, what is the address where Ona Judge is buried? Uh, from a previous talk, uh, Greenland was mentioned, but is there a street address or is it a private property? So um, it is on private property. I was just answering that. Um, in, in Greenland, um, it's off the beaten part, way in the woods. Um, but the trail, the Black Heritage Trail is working to preserve the site right now. It's been run over by snowmobilers and really is in need of some attention. And we're working to see if we can get a right away to the property because there's uh, it's not the only grave site there and, um, and preserving that history. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions. Hold on a second. I would also mention, just because we're talking about sailing and ships and stuff, that one of the um, premier jobs for enslaved men and free Black men were working on ships. Um, Jeff Bolster, a Portsmouth resident, um, um, did a lot of research. And he, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> he, um, he wrote the book um, Black Jacks, which talks about um, all the black sailors here. And it was one of the, you know, a dangerous um, job, but it was definitely one that enslaved men and free blacks could do. And the, it was a highly paid position as well. Um, and the, uh, we see a lot of 
African Americans, Ona Marie Judge's husband was um, Stain, Jack Stain, was also a black Jack. And we see them off to sea at a, you know, for long periods of time, you know, and the women had to stay home and try to survive in these not very comfortable environment, not only by landscape, but also by race. Wasn't also um, Esther Whipple Molino, one of her husbands was a sailor? Yeah worked on ship. So you, Dinah, I mean, you know, we know Prince Whipple, hopefully one of the signers of the, of the petition for freedom and Dinah Whipple who, who ran the, the school, um, yeah. their, their daughter, right, was married to someone working in ships. You know, because of race and racism, the being a black jag was one of the few jobs that were open to black men, Africans, Afri um, African-Americans that they could actually get paid to do and could do. Again, it came with huge risks, but it was one job that was open to poor whites and blacks <laughs> being sailors on these dangerous voyages. We had another question come in um, from Val Moyer. She says, could you tell us more about the ongoing research happening at the Black Heritage Trail? Um, that there's always stuff going on. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what um, the, the right now we are working to expand statewide. And um, so we're not just um, focusing on Portsmouth, but um, you know, we've got 14 other towns that we're looking at. Um, I should maybe come back to something here in Portsmouth. There, there is the Langdon, um, the known Langdon burial site for their enslaved people. And recently we found um, some sites in the woods, some burials in the woods on the Langdon property. That's also, th there were a, huge, a number of um, sites there. So we're doing research on those sites, see what that tells us who, who may be there. So, and they, they are in, in Warner, um, we're looking at the uh, Revolutionary War veterans who settled at the foot of Coit Mountain. Um, uh, Vance, the Coit Mountain was actually named after one of the uh, Black Revolutionary War veterans. Um, in Milford, there's the story of Harriet Wilson that's pretty much documented. And it just, the stories go on. So, um, what we're doing right now is working um, to honor these stories, make them visible, uh, create curriculum for K through 12, curricula around these stories um, so that we have another generation having a, um, not just black history, but American history uh, awareness um, in our area. So there, there, there's quite a bit of stuff going on that we're looking at. Okay, that, uh, there aren't any more questions in the chat section. Um, let's see here. So I'll, I'll give everyone um, another minute or two, uh, see if there's any that pop up here. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, in January of this year, the Gundalo Company stood up a um, diversity, equity, and inclusion task force uh, to take a look at our organization to make sure that we were doing all that we could to become a more diverse, inclusive, and, and equitable organization. And um, so they've done a lot of good work in the last five months. Uh, but I just wanted to say that uh, it's events like this and information that's coming out uh, from the Black Heritage Trail in New Hampshire and other organizations that all feeds into the things that we do. Some of you or the, those of you that are associated with the Gundalo Company know that we do a heritage talk every time we go out on the river. And um, for a while now, we've been talking about making sure that we were including the type of history that you're talking about, Jerry Ann. Um, so we're working towards that. Uh, and our goal is to become a better organization in that respect. So I wanted to thank you thank for you, 
joining us this evening and providing us with all this. There's been a, a number of things in the uh, chat section uh, about the presentation this evening and some good information there. So I would encourage folks to check that out. And again, we're recording this. So uh, in a few days, you'll get a link uh, via email that you can go to and come back to these uh, to this presentation and, and uh, review it if you'd like to do that more. Um, I, I do want to mention, Rick, that um, one of the programs that we're collaborating with you in is that we're going to have um, a living history um, gondola tour where um, our, uh, in our tour guide who does the living history interpretation for Jack Staines will be on the gondola and um, telling that story on the gondola. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think that that's going to be really exciting to actually put a sailor back on the ship. And we are too. I mean, that's story. just a fantastic idea. And uh, we're getting all that uh, together and uh, we'll have a date and put it up on our website here as soon as we can and give people the opportunity to, uh, to sign up for that. So um, more to come on that, uh, hopefully very shortly. Thank you. You're welcome. And again, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, what I'd like to do is to have everybody unmute and give Jerry Ann a round and uh, Tanya a, a round of applause for their uh, participation tonight. So let's see, you should be able to unmute yourself and uh, do a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs> I would also ask people to think about if they if this is the history that they're hearing for the first time and you are in Portsmouth or you're in your own hometown, what does this knowledge of this history, how do you view your landscape um, when you know or aware or this history is brought to you? Do you see it differently or think about things differently just for our own personal journey? What does it do to the landscape to really reintroduce this story to, to our consciousness? Hey folks, I'm going to have to end the, the meeting. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Got to go. No though. worries. Thank you, Rich. You're welcome. Thanks again, okay. Jerry. And thanks everyone else for attending. Appreciate Hi, it. Hi, Kathy. Mm -hmm.